Kedwin Weibel RSL. Have you noticed how life is full of creeps? Creeps. Out there in Creepland, there's lots of creeping going on. And I've identified two creeps relevant to my subject today. The first is what I call creeping decoupling. Have you never heard of creeping decoupling? Let me take you back to your younger days in the first flush of love. Your first boyfriend or girlfriend. How did you manifest your undying love and affection? You used to walk down the street, you know? Embrace with your hand around their waist. Did you? You remember that? But then it got... <laughs> you should get out more, madam. You should get out more. But then as we progressed, it became a little bit more familiar. It became a little bit physically uncomfortable to be in step all the time with your hand around their waist. So we resorted to hand-holding. Didn't we remember hand-holding? Remember that? Mm -hmm. And then as we matured even more, hand-holding became a little bit passe. So five minutes ago. And we graduated to what I call parallel ambulation. You know that parallel ambulation? You often see more mature age people walking down the street <laughs> side by side. Not touching, side by side. And the distance between them tends to get wider as you get older. Have you noticed that? <laughs> and then we graduated even later in life to what I call the royals. <laughs> the royals. Does that sound familiar? Yes. There's she up there. <laughs> And there's he back here, right? Is that right, sir? And you have to shout to each other if you say anything at all. And then finally, usually as we enter the stage of solohood in later life, we enter the fandangos. You know the fandangos? Where particularly if you're solo, you get surrounded. Surrounded by lots of helping people. Have you notice that? It's a bit like what the young call a mosh pit. You know what a mosh pit is? <laughs> All these people desperate to help you in your later life. Creeping decoupling. Where are you in the decoupling creep? You can look at each other and tell each other if you wish to. <laughs> the second creep I've identified is what I call frailty creep. Frailty creep. Have you heard of bracket creep? It's been in the news lately. It's a concept in income tax called bracket creep, where the longer you work and the more you earn, the more you creep up the income tax bracket. Have you noticed that? Well, I call this particular development later life frailty creep. Gone are the days, have you noticed, when you retired at 65 and dropped dead at 66, still clutching the gold watch. Now we go through life after retirement at four miles per hour, three miles per hour, two miles per hour, one mile per hour, and we stop. We don't die, we stop and enter a stage of what I call dependency. My father is a classic creeper. He used to live on five acres and he used to have a ride on mower. And he used to love to get on his ride on mower every weekend without fail and ride around and mow the lawn on the five acres. It was a bit of respite. <laughs> and then as he creeped, he moved into a suburban house and bought a Victor. <laughs> downsizing he was, downsizing. And then he moved into a manufactured home park where the backyard is the size of a postage stamp. And what did he buy? He bought one of those old push mowers, you know those ones where the blades go around at 100 miles an hour? And it takes him two minutes to push that around the backyard. But now he's clever. He's entered into an arrangement with my family for us to provide him with accommodation. And guess who does the mowing now? Me, me, me. He knows which side his bread is buttered on. This is called transition. Have you noticed how life transitions as you get older? And what I want to talk to you about today is the options available as we transition. Because they are huge. 
They are huge. We've got staying at home. Have you heard of that one? <laughs> yeah, staying at home. You got a home, Adam? Yes, yeah, staying at home. You can move into a retirement village. You can sell your home and rent and spend the kids' inheritance. I've got a woman at the moment who's been divorced four times. She's 82, and the last property settlement she got from her fourth husband, she received $8 million in cash. She keeps coming back to see to me and says, Brian, I just can't spend it. I can't even spend the interest. And I said, Madam, you keep coming back to me and I'll help you spend it. <laughs> we can sell and rent and spend it, become a skinhead, spend kids' inheritance now. Or we can move into a retirement village, a manufactured home park, we may even move into aged care, or may even enter what's called a norks. Have you heard of a norks? Come on, you older people have heard of norks, haven't you? It's an acronym for naturally occurring retirement communities. Naturally occurring retirement. What is it? Older people gathering together, either in independent lifestyle, or together in the same house, sharing house. Do you remember sharing house when you were young? And everyone had their own Vegemite in the fridge, remember that? Older people are now doing it themselves, sharing house, supporting and caring for each other. I've got a man who lives in what I call the Hotel de Parc. He's a millionaire. His preference lifestyle is to live in public parks. All he has, are you deaf, who, uh, who said what? Madam, it's true, trust me, I'm a lawyer, it's true. He lives in public parks and he's a millionaire. That's his choice of lifestyle. And he can choose. He has the ability to choose. There are people who are moving into what's called granny flats. Have you heard of granny flats? Are there any grannies in the audience? I don't think so. No, no. <laughs> so let me just talk in the brief time I have about some of those options. The first one I want to talk about is that first downsizing temptation we have. When we're living at home, husband and wife, quarter acre block, Old Queenslander, ladders are, mm-mm, mm-mm, don't like ladders anymore. We think about a retirement village. Remember Joan Rivers? She died last year. A Cidic American comedian who wrote a book once called Don't Count the Candles, Just Keep the Fire Lit. <laughs> and she devoted an entire chapter in her book to retirement villages. And she described them as minimum security prisons with palms. <laughs> where people stare at the sprinklers and have dinner at five. <laughs> Gerontological gulags, full of mind-numbing architectural sameness. Sunny sterility, where every day is Sunday. Anyone live in a retirement village? <laughs> hey, boys, boys, for those boys in the audience, can I tell you something? You may have heard of what's called the masculinity index, the number of males per 100 females. Before the age of 80, boys, the girls have it. There are fewer girls and more boys. Once you get past 80, boys, there are lots more girls and very few boys. <laughs> and one of the biggest issues I confront in retirement villages is relationship issues. <laughs> where that single elderly gentleman becomes a magnet <laughs> for conjugal bliss. I was involved in a mediation of a dispute, a menage a trois, between two women in a retirement village and an elderly Lothario in the middle, both competing for his affections. We had a mediation trying to resolve it. And at one stage, he took me outside and said, Brian, do you know what this is all about? I said, no, John, what's this all about? He said, I'm an octum. I said, what, uh, an octum? He said, yeah, I'm an octum. I said, what's an octum? He said, it's an acronym for Older chicks dig me. <laughs> he was loving every minute of it. <laughs> Retirement villages are a very unusual, complex legal financial structure. Really complex. You live in a gated community normally amongst people of your own age or lifestyle. 
they call it age apartheid. <laughs> the biggest retirement village in the world is called the Villages in Florida. It has 81,000 residents, spread over 32 square miles. It has 52 shopping centres, 50,000 golf carts, and it's famous for a particular unpleasant fact. It has the highest rate of sexually transmitted diseases in America. <laughs> Because old people can't get sexual, can they? They're too old. So you know what they've done? They've introduced sex education classes for the retirement village residents. <laughs> complex legal structures, very complex. Most of the legal arrangements are you signed a 99-year lease. And for a lease of the unit, not an ownership, not freehold, for lease of the unit, you pay this large, what's called ingoing contribution, a price, a purchase price, as if you were buying it freehold. The biggest price I've seen paid for a retirement village unit was $820,000. That's for the right to get a lease. And when you move in, you then have to continue to pay as if you were leasing the unit, because you pay what's called a general services charge. And then when you come to leave, the exit you have to pay as well what's called an exit fee. The highest one I've seen was 45%. In other words, 45% of what you get from the sale of the unit, you pay back to the operator. But can I tell you, you don't buy a retirement village unit for the investment, do you? You don't. You buy it for the lifestyle. That sense of security amongst people of the same age as you. That is attractive for many people, that, that sense of security, that sense of oneness, of sameness, that abseiling wall. <laughs> because 90% of people who live in retirement villages, according to the surveys, are happy, are happy with their choice. And you can understand why that would be, because it's a manicured environment where things are provided for you. You don't have to leave, not only that, now retirement village operators are introducing care into retirement villages. So the old adage used to be you move in as an independent retiree in a retirement village unit and then when the day came and you had to transition to care, you moved out into a aged care facility. Now you don't. Now you can move into the retirement village as an independent retiree and die there. You can receive care if you need it in the retirement village unit. Which makes it interesting as a proposition for marketers because one of the worst things you can do is try and sell a unit or a home where someone has died and the agent walks around introducing the prospective purchase and says, yes, that's where the previous resident died, in that very bed there. It doesn't sell life, it sells death. You can die in that bed just like the previous resident did. <laughs> but it's a fantastic idea when you think about it because that transition from a retirement village to aged care is fraught. Because you have to pay to move into aged care and you're depending on selling your retirement village to pay to move into aged care. So if you don't have to do that, you can stay there and die or have what we call your celestial transfer. The kids love it. The kids love it. Remember, you're living for your kids still, aren't you? You want to, you want to leave them something. You, want to, you don't want to leave them something. Kids hate retirement villages because it's so hard to get the money back when you die or leave, <laughs> isn't it? And your investment decisions are more their investment decisions, aren't they? They're the de facto investor of their inheritance. Retirement villages. Most people love them, and it's a great way to downsize to less work. So you can pursue all those other pursuits you have. Don't you? <laughs> huh? Embroidery, madam, is it? Embroidery. <laughs> or you can move into another one called a manufactured home park. Have you heard of that? Used to be called a mobile home park. Used to be called a caravan park. But I dare you, I challenge you to look at a manufactured home park today and compare it to a retirement village 
to see any difference. None whatsoever. You'll see lovely little self-contained units with a big community centre with the abseiling wall and this looks exactly the same as a retirement village but a totally different legal and financial structure. Simpler. In a manufactured home park, you buy the house you live in. You buy it. You own it. But you lease the land underneath from the operator of the manufactured home park. So it's a combination of own the unit, lease the land underneath. So when you go to leave, you can actually bequeath that unit that you own to somebody. You can't do that in a retirement village. But you lease the land underneath. Okay? That's the manufactured home park. You pay to build the unit or you buy the unit from the existing resident. Quite simple structure. And then we can move a bit further along the downsizing path, can't we? Can you see the frailty creeping? <laughs> frailty creeping. It's frailty creeping time. We can move into aged care. Aged care. Who wants to move into aged care? Come on, someone must. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? No one ever wants to move into aged care. But guess what? Some of us will have to. You will. You will. I may have to. You may have to. My parents may have to. Anyone may have to. Why? Because we can't live at home anymore. We can't live where we live anymore. And that can happen. You can't live anymore where you used to live. I have a client at the moment. He's decided there's no way in the world he's going to leave his home. He's going to die in his bed. He's decided because he's rich, he's going to pay for home care to be delivered to him 24 hours a day, seven days a week. How much is it costing him? $8,500 a week. A week. Now, have you got $8,500 a week to spend? That's over $400,000 a year. Just to stay at home. So the reality is, if you get to a stage where you need high care and you can't afford home care, aged care may be the only alternative. So you can move into a facility. And when you move into a facility, the hotel environment, home-like environment, <laughs> the home-like environment of an aged care facility, from the 1st of July last year, you're going to be paying a lot more money. You're going to be paying what's called a RAD. Have you heard of a RAD? Aged care is full of acronyms. A RAD is Refundable Accommodation Deposit. It used to be called an accommodation bond. Anyone who moves into aged care, mostly, will be paying a RAD. The biggest RAD I've seen paid was $4 million. $4 million. Now, why would you pay $4 million for the privilege of moving into a room in a <coughs> home-like environment of an aged care facility? Because this person wanted to qualify for the pension. <laughs> People will walk over hot coals to get $1 of pension so they get all the accoutrements that come with it. All those other benefits that we get from having a pension, a status. So they'll even pay $4 million to an aged care facility just to get that oh, pension. Amazing, isn't it? So aged care is now really complex. It's really financially expensive. And you know what the most expensive event in most people's lives are? Because life is event management. Have you noticed that? Is managing events. We're all event managers. The biggest common event and the most significant event for older people is what's called separation. Not separation by desire, separation by circumstance. For example, by illness. Where mum and dad live at home and mum or dad can't look after each other anymore. Heard of that happening? So mum or dad has to move into aged care. They are separated. As a consequence, guess what happens? The cost of living now doubles. Because there they were living at home together, sharing the cost of living at home together. One cost. Suddenly, separated. Two different homes. Double the cost. And we Australians are really good at planning, aren't we? We plan for these things, don't we? 
No, we don't. No, we don't. So that can be a major crisis. And it's particularly complex if you're in a second marriage, third marriage, or fourth marriage. Anyone here in a fifth marriage? <laughs> Listen to this example. Listen to this example. This is the case I've got at the moment. Here's an 84-year-old who married for the second time a 78-year-old 10 years ago. They both have children from their first marriage. They have both made wills giving everything to their respective children. They agreed when they married they'd keep their finances separate. He's rich, she's poor. What happens? He can't look after her anymore. She has to go into aged care. They want her to pay a rad of $300,000. She doesn't have $300,000, but he does. Now, he comes to see his lawyer. And his lawyer says something to him very interesting. He says, do you realise that if you pay that $300,000 from your money to that aged care facility for your wife, the law says, the law, that when she dies or leaves that facility, that money has to be paid to her estate. Not back to you, to her estate. Consequence, suddenly when she dies, her estate is boosted by the sum of $300,000. And under her will, that all goes to her children. And he goes, what? <laughs> How far will love go? <laughs> Would you do what he was asked to do? Does love require you, does matrimonial duty require you to pay that money on her behalf? Knowing that you're kissing goodbye to $300,000 and paying it to those reprobates <laughs> called your stepchildren. Would you do it? He came in wanting to do it. He did. She's my wife. I love her. He walked out <laughs> saying, I'm not going to pay that money. <laughs> I'm not going to pay that money. Isn't that interesting? What happens to her is this, madam. Her children were her enduring powers of attorney, and they did nothing. What happened was the aged care facility, because interest is accruing on the $300,000, that's 6% per day, per, per year, so it's going up, 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 up. Aged care facility, very agitated. They apply to QCAT, the Queensland Civil Administrative Tribunal, to sack the children, her children, as her enduring power of attorney, to appoint the public trustee. Now, what, if I was advising the public trustee, what would I advise them to do? Bring a family law property application in the family court so that they can divide the property, the matrimonial property, so she can garner from the property enough money to pay that rad. Because no one's done it yet. They just sit in their hands. If I had put my other hat on, I would have been doing this months ago, applying to the family court for a property order. See how complicated life can be even in later life? Later life, for those who choose more than one spouse. <laughs> Finally, can I tell you another trend in later life that's happening in terms of lifestyle? A big trend in lifestyle is the family are coming into the lifestyle provision. Hmm. You know, before the Second World War, what used to happen if mum or dad needed to be looked after? They used to move in with the family, didn't they? They did. After the Second World War, two things started to happen. One, the church and charitable sector started to build what they call convalescent homes. Do you remember them? Con where you convalesced. What, what do you do when you convalesce? Convalesce. Sounds like lying down. Convalescing. And secondly, what happened was women started to go into the workforce, thereby not being able or freed up to provide care for mum or dad. So when mum or dad needed care, they used to move into the convalescent homes. But now, as we speak, something funny is happening. What's happening? The children, realising the cost of aged care and realising that in order to fund the cost of aged care, 
they may have to sell the castle, the home, which was meant for them in the will. <laughs> are looking at alternative arrangements that preserves their inheritance, but at the same time provides a lifestyle for their parents. So what are they doing? Mum and Dad are moving in with children. <gasps> oh, God. <laughs> and if I ask the question, how many of you would like to move with your children? Uh, uh, no one ever puts their hand up. <laughs> it's got lots of financial prudence about it. It's a very effective financial lifestyle decision when you think about it. So much so that lawyers who are great barometers of social change, as you know, we, we've got a feeling for what's going on out there in the community. <laughs> we don't sit in ivory towers behind our desks. We're out there in the community, like I am today, feeling what's happening out there in the community. <laughs> Sniffing the breeze. <laughs> what's happening is this. We are doing what's called family agreements. Contracts between members of the family about the care of their mum or dad. Just finished one. Here it is in summary. 84-year-old self-funded retiree living in a high-rise unit at West End. Four adult children. Having difficulties with everyday living activities. One of her daughters puts her hand up and says, Mum, why don't you sell the unit and use part of the proceeds to build an extension of my lovely home at Pullenbar? <laughs> Four-wheel drive territory where you can live for the rest of your life and I will look after you for the rest of your life. Now, the other three children in the family were very suspicious. <laughs> Why? Because they could see part of their inheritance being consumed by their sister to bolster the value of her lovely home at Pullenvale. But none of them, including mum, wanted her to grace the halls of a aged care facility. So what were they going to do? We had two meetings with the entire family, and we nodded out a written family agreement, which says this. Mum will sell her unit. She will use part of the proceeds to build an extension to the daughter's home at Pullenvale in exchange for which the daughter promises to care for her for the rest of her life. But here's the rub. The money that mum spends to build the extension will be a debt due and owing by the daughter to mum repayable on demand or if mum has to leave. But here's the real rub. That debt will be amortised or reduced over time in deference to the care being provided by the daughter to mum. <gasps> That's outrageous. <laughs> That's anathema to most of us, isn't it? What does that mean? That means the daughter is getting paid to look after mum. Oh, that's outrageous. Look what that mother did for her. Really? Really? What would you do? This is what the family decided because the daughter had to give up her job to do this. She had her own children to look after. This is what this family decided should happen, to be fair. And it's working great. And we come with the what-ifs of the relationship. What if the daughter's marriage broke down and the house has to be sold? What if the daughter's husband went bankrupt and the house has to be sold? What if the daughter's relationship with mum broke down and they couldn't stand the side of each other? And we cover that in the agreement as well. This is all part of what I call family planning. <laughs> you, remember, you remember that? You, you remember that? Uh, 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 uh. It shouldn't be that long a memory. <laughs> if I could just leave you with one message today is don't wait for the C change. C means capital C, crisis. Don't wait for the crisis. Because there will be a crisis in everyone's family's lives. There'll be a C change. Don't wait for it to happen and then try and do something. Plan for the crisis now. Do some family planning because that will keep your family together. When you don't do crisis planning, it will separate them, it will explode them, it will implode them, and you will leave a legacy of family dysfunction and hatred. Is that what you want? Maybe you do. <laughs> but if you don't, if you don't, start having conversations and talking about event management. It's worth your while and your family's while. Thank you for your time.